Good evening to you all. I'm Anne Maria Nicholson and I'm your moderator tonight for this evening's Wakehurst 2023 State Election Candidate Forum, which is co-hosted by the Northern Beaches Climate Action Network and Voices of Warringah. So we're going to begin today with an acknowledgement of country, followed by a few words from Voices of Warringah. Will Farrer, who's a young Aboriginal student from the Northern Beaches, will do the acknowledgement on behalf of everyone here tonight, including our candidates. Warama. My name's Will Farr, a Wiradjuri boy, blessed to grow up on Karagal country. Today I seek permission from the ancestors to be here, the Karagal people. I pay my respect to all ancestors, elders and any Aboriginal people who join us today. I acknowledge Alan Murray, Chair of Metro Land Council, and Nathan Moran, CEO of Metro Land Council. Before colonisation, men and women thrived in this beautiful place. There was an abundance of food and water and the land and waterways were cared for and respected by the Kaomai. I ask those ancestors to look over us today and give us wisdom to uphold and respect the land and waterways where we live, work and play. Thank you. And now Andy Hall. Uh, sorry. Alex, sorry. Alex Hall, I'm sorry. Voices of Warringah is a non-partisan community group that was formed in 2018 to allow the community, community to be better involved in democracy through providing a platform for the community to voice matters of concern and importance. Tonight's forum is about the community having their say about what's important of ahead of the upcoming state election and ensuring the best possible community outcomes. We'd like to thank everybody for coming and being involved. We look forward to hearing your questions and likewise hearing from the candidates uh, for the electorate of Wakehurst. Um, I'd like to thank Nigel from the Northern Beaches Climate Action Network, who's co-hosting tonight's event. Just over here. Um, and I will now introduce tonight's moderator um, um, for the forum, um, who many of you will know, Anne-Maria Nicholson. Uh, Anne-Maria is a distinguished local author and journalist um, and a former Manly councillor. Uh, her latest novel is Poker Protocol, set on our very own Northern Beaches. Uh, so please welcome Anne Maria. So here we go. I'm sure, like me, you're getting very excited in the countdown. I think it's just about 15 days to the state election, which looks like being closer than many for decades, if um, if the polls are right. Um, so today on the Northern Beaches, we seem to be in the news everywhere. So there's a lot of issues in this part of the world that are that are having traction and grabbing people's attention. And we have a pretty hot contest here in Wakehurst, which has been held by Brad Hazard, who I acknowledge is here tonight, for, for many, many years. And he is vacating, he's, he's retiring from the seat. And so we have a completely new set of characters. And I'm very pleased to tell you that all of the five candidates who are seeking your support to go to Macquarie Street are all here tonight. So I'd like to welcome them um, up here. And we have, in the Nigel way, a little flourish, a top hat, and each of the candidates will come and take a number, and that will be the order in which they will speak. So uh, we've got all their pictures up here. So we may start with Susan Sorensen, could come up, followed by Ethan Hernjack, then Michael Regan, Sue Wright, and Toby Williams. Please come up to the stage. Yeah, go around and get, go around and get a hat, a number. <laughs> uh, so how, how this evening is going to work is that each candidate will have three minutes to tell a little bit about themselves and while they're putting themselves forward for election. And then I'll open it up to you, the, um, the audience, for questions. 
There was also the um, opportunity to submit questions earlier, so I've got a whole pile of questions here as well, and we'll try and get through as many as possible. Some questions will be directed just to one candidate only, and more to when there's something that's in, in, uh, you know, that, that affects everybody. So, uh, without further ado, oh, one more thing. We here are so lucky to live in a democracy, something denied to more people in the world than not. And while we like robust interaction, and that's why we're all here, we also want respect. So please treat all the candidates with respect, and when we do get round to questions, keeping them short. Um, I just point out that uh, we're very strict on the three minutes per candidate, and so when you're two and a half minutes down... You'll this is what you'll hear. <laughs> and and that's that's the uh, that's what happens after three minutes. <laughs> but it could be live by then. Do you know how this is the small bell? Yeah. You then have thirty more seconds, and as soon as your three minutes is up, you will hear this. That sounds like the old Manny Ferry. And then, and then we'll, uh, and then the last question from the audience at about 20 past eight, I think you've existed. Yeah, don't worry about that. Oh, okay. So, uh, where's that list of the numbers? Okay, who got number one? Michael Regan, there you go. Yeah. Would you like to sit or stand? It's, been... yeah, it's fine, good. Ironic when I got six today in the ballot draw, I'll get one tonight. Oh, good evening, everybody, and thank you very much for coming out. It's a um, big deal for you all to do this, so it's much appreciated. I'm Michael Regan, and I'm standing for the seat of Wakehurst because I believe there are massive challenges ahead for our local community, and I think I'm the best person for that job to tackle them, particularly as an independent, especially given what's been going on lately. And I've put about quite a few priorities, and I can um, talk about very quickly the, the vibrant communities. Is We have, like, the Brookvale Structure Plan, the French's Forest Structure Plan. Uh, I believe the French's Forest Structure Plan still hasn't had complete sign-off with the public amenities yet, so we need to be in there to make sure that we get our fair share of public infrastructure that hasn't been, it's been promised, but not committed yet. Um, Brookvale Structure Plan, similarly, is a plan to protect the industrial areas, enhance the, um, the Brookvale Arts District, make sure that we can have nightlife and nightclubs and the like, and we need, we need our government departments and our two MPs, the Manly MP and the Wakehurst MP, working together to push those government departments, because as Brad and I can tell you from our dealings with people like Crown Lands, it is hopeless. And equally, you go to something like Department of Planning and we talk about climate protection, we talk about things that we can do better there, and we have issues with, and I think it was Ethan's idea or the Greens' idea in relation to having a commissioner for seawalls. That's a great idea because there is an absolute nightmare dealing with the Crown Lands and the Department of Planning who basically legislate, you can have a seawall on private property, but not on our land, which is the beach. You can't put any sand nourishment there. And that's something that we want to talk about more and get more engaged in. Uh, I've spoken about lower energy bills. Cost of living is a big factor in this election. I've talked about having up to $15,000 worth of um, interest-free loans to be paid off over a 10 or 15-year period, because that will have the most impact on, for the environment as well with net zero emissions. But you can get, you're paying $1,000 off a year interest-free. That's, you're getting a solar system about 10k. That's basically everything you need for solar. So you're getting saved two to three thousand dollars instantly every year just by putting putting solar on. And why aren't we mandating it also for uh, strata units? Why are we not helping these businesses? There's a local businesses that have this technology to make it work. So we should be mandating that. Um, you'll hear Nigel bang on about the uh, the National's Construction Code. He's spot on. Council staff have been advocating for it, but we need our Department of Planning and our and our ministers at a state level advocating for it nationally. It needs to happen and it needs to happen now. So maybe there's a way we can do it locally. Uh, affordable housing options, people want to downsize, people want to um, start families. There's different mixes. We have a shortage, a critical shortage. I've gone to the Department of Planning before and the Minister uh, with, a, with a plan, loved it, Nothing, no action happened because no one's advocating for it. And I come back to that, that thing, no one's advocating for it. 30 seconds. 30 seconds. The buses, the bottlenecks, the buses need fixing, we all hear the stories, but there's no tunnel, what's plan B to fix the congestion? We have a plan. We've approached Infrastructure Australia and got it signed off. We need the state to lobby it and we need the federal government to help pay for it. And we've got plans there to fix the congestion now, not just in the future. And I'm talking specifically about mostly Pittwater Road, but you've also got options for Wakehurst Parkway. 
and I'll stop there because that's my three minutes. Uh, and our second speaker is Sue Wright for the ALP. Hi everyone, thanks for coming tonight. I want to start by paying my respects to the traditional owners of the land that we meet on and um, my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself because probably a lot of people don't know me. Um, I've lived on the Northern Beaches all my life and uh, grew up in Narrabeen and on Collaroy Plateau. I went to Collaroy Plateau Public School and then Cromer High School. Um, so my experience is generally as an activist. I started at the age of 11 with a petition for the seals in Canada for being clubbed to death. So I door knocked around Collaroy Plateau, got over a thousand signatures and sent it to the Canadian government. So from there, um, at 18, I joined the Labor Party and I was also an active member of Greenpeace as well. Um, so I also um, formed a, a group, a local community group called Mothers Against Nuclear Testing, and we held a wake for the Pacific Ocean at Long Reef Beach. Um, more recently, I've been a member for the last six years of the Monavale, Save the Monavale Hospital Committee, um, where we worked tirelessly before the 2019 election to try and retain our public hospital and not just have a private public hospital. I'm also a member of the Save the Manly Ferries, once again fighting privatisation to retain our, our freshwater ferries and to get rid of the defect riddled emerald ferries. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I'm a member of the USU and for this election I was endorsed by Emily's List Australia who um, support progressive Australian women in state and um, federal politics. Um, oh God, sorry, I need to get my notes, sorry. <laughs> sorry. We've also um, supported the bus drivers with the RTBU and um, the workers down there when Chris Mins was our shadow transport minister. So all my activism has a common theme. It's all about anti-privatisation, which doesn't work for the community. It um, takes assets away from the state and puts up prices for all the community. So, <clears throat> so as we know, in the last 12 years, uh, over 20,000 assets of New South Wales have been sold off. We've lost the, the Port Authorities, the Port of Newcastle, West Connects, our buses, our ferries, so many more. So it's obviously not working, it's time for a change. It's time for a fresh start in New South Wales. And um, thank you, Joy. So when you vote, vote one for Labor, vote right for Wakehurst. Thank you. Thank you. And our third speaker is the candidate for the Liberal Party, Toby Williams. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm delighted to be here this evening with all of you. My name is Toby Williams, and I'm proud to stand before you as the Liberal candidate for Wakehurst. Can I join uh, Will and Sue also in acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land upon which we are gathered this evening, and thank Will for the wonderful welcome to country. I'd also like to acknowledge Catherine, Nigel, and their team for facilitating this very important community event this evening. Thank you. And lastly, can I acknowledge my fellow candidates, not just for putting their hand up, but for enhancing the political process, the democratic process here in Wakehurst. Thank you. By way of, oh, round of applause. By way of background, I'm a lifelong local. I've lived in French's Forest for 28 years. I went to Wakehurst Public School and then Davidson High School before completing a Bachelor of Commerce at Macquarie University. My family have deep ties to the local community. My mother was a local police officer for almost 20 years and now works at a local high school. And my father was a Manly Sea Eagles legend who played in the 1987 grand final winning team. Go Manly. Both of my parents instilled in me the importance of hard work and community service. And that is why I am here this evening. I want to work hard for you to serve the Wakehurst community in the New South Wales Parliament. You're going to ask questions of the candidates this evening and we will give you answers to those questions. 
But what is more important are your views, because whoever wins this election is tasked with representing your views, your opinions in the New South Wales Parliament. That is the role of an elected representative. Now, I've seen over the last 12 years, and certainly during the last six and a half years that I've worked for Brad Hazard, and I acknowledge his presence this evening, what can be achieved with a Liberal Member of Parliament in a coalition government. Straight away, Northern Beaches Hospital, Warringah Road underpass, our Beeline buses. Having a Liberal Member of Parliament in a coalition government is a winning combination for this electorate because it ensures that you have an elected representative whose voice is heard at the very heart of government. You won't have that with the alternative. I love the community. I live, work and volunteer in Wakehurst. Over the last 10 years, I've had the good fortune to be involved in a range of community organisations, from the Salvation Army to sporting organisations and DYRSL, amongst many others. It is that love for the community that I live in and work in and volunteer in that drives me to want to achieve positive outcomes for individual constitu constituents, but also for the betterment of the community as a whole. So thank you very much, everyone, for being here this evening. I look forward to your questions. And again, thank you. And the next candidate is Susan Sorensen from the Animal Justice Party. And thank you for putting this on today, um, Nigel. Um, uh, yeah, my name is Susan Sorens and I'm standing for the Animal Justice Party because the AJP is the only party who will stand up for the rights and protections of all animals, regardless of what classification they fall under. The AJP is also the only party who will make a direct link between how we live our lives, what we eat, what we wear, what we consume and how we behave, and the direct impact that that has on our environment. The AJP, along with um, clean, green energy, um, we are also looking at um, methane, um, CO2, and all those other um, parts that are actually destroying our natural world for our younger generations. I am really... <laughs> I'm really happy to be standing for the AJP because they have a really se core sense of um, what is right and what is right for future generations. We really need to be looking at what we're going to be leaving for our future generations by making big changes, both globally, um, locally, and as individuals. Now, I would I better get my notes too, actually. <laughs> oh, dear. Yeah, don't say ding yet. <laughs> oh, and my glasses. Yeah. So now, has, there's never been a more urgent time than now to be able to stand up for the rights of our environment and of everybody who needs the planet to be able to survive. We need politicians in place who have a big vision and are going to be able to put in place the hard, make hard decisions to make sure that we are protecting everybody on the planet. So I like to think globally, I like to act locally. So as a local candidate, I will be um, looking at um, lobbying for a genuine guardianship of all native bushland. We cannot continue the destruction that's continuing across this state and across, New South, uh, across um, the northern beaches. We need to conserve, preserve and protect what we have because the animals that we have, we depend on them for biodiversity and for our own health. Um, if we can't look after them, we're not going to be able to look after ourselves. I will be um, looking for securing funding for um, the animals that have already been displaced as a result of, of um, habitat destruction. So I'll be looking at um, further funding for virtual fencing, for culverts, and uh, wildlife crossings. I'd also be wanting to ban the horrific 1080 poison, which that's been used in and out of, um, across Australia and the northern beaches. It is an indiscriminate killer, killing native wildlife, farmed animals, dogs, cats, any animal that's um, unfortunate enough to um, ingest it. Thanks very much.
And our final candidate talk tonight is Ethan Hoonjack from the Greens. Hi, I'm Ethan Hernjack, and I'm your Greens candidate for Wakehurst. Some of you may recognise me from the Narrabeen and the McKellar local and federal elections, where I was also the Greens candidate. And it seems like now, <laughs> and it seems like now I'm going for the trifecta with this state election here in Wakehurst. <laughs> I currently study at Macquarie University, where I'm doing a law degree, and I hope to specialise in climate, environment, and planning law. I've lived on the northern beaches for all of my 19 years and I've come to appreciate just how lucky we are to be able to call this place home. I've always had a keen interest in politics and since beginning my law degree, I've seen just how governments have the power to make all of our lives better. But un unfortunately, both major parties have, uh, have basically used this power to enrich their mates, destroy integrity and take the residents of this state for a ride. I enrolled to vote at 16, even though I wouldn't be able to cast a ballot for another two years. But little, little did I know at that time that when I would be able to cast that first ballot, I would also be the candidate in that local election. <laughs> the Northern Beaches Greens have provided me with an incredible sense of community and belonging, and I'm so very privileged to have had their support for these last couple of elections. Stretching from the bush to the beach, Wakehurst is an incredibly beautiful area, but unfortunately it's under threat. For the last six months, I've been door knocking here in Wakehurst, and I've been asking residents about their local concerns. We've got the Lizard Rock development sites, the French's Forest Town Centre, privatisation of our Northern Beaches Hospital, the Beaches Link Tunnel, the flooding of the Wakehurst Parkway are just some of the largest community issues that we face. Then, of course, we've got the statewide issues. ICAC, public transport, renters' rights, housing affordability, the protection of climate and biodiversity, and then, uh, of course, education, healthcare, and gambling. As some of you may already know, the Greens New South Wales have never taken and never will take a single corporate donation. We cap individual donations at $6,600 per annum, and because of this, we are allowed to speak freely about the issues we face and how we're going to solve them. We're not beholden to powerful donors who will make back party rooms and force our state further down the line of privatisation. Because we put our money where our mouth is when it comes to campaign finance reform, we rely on grassroots democracy to resource our campaigns. Door knocking, letterboxing and hosting street stalls have been the hallmarks of our campaign here in Wakehurst and we would love to have your support in these last couple of weeks because our movement is powered by people, not big corporations. I'd like to thank, of course, Voices of... Um, I'd like to thank MB Can, Voices of Warringa and the incredible Nigel Howard for an amazing event and ask you to remember that nothing changes if nothing changes. Thank you. <laughs> five candidates. How fortunate we are to have um, such a good crop of people willing to go into public office. I thought I would kick off the first question tonight with what is making headlines at the moment, which is Lizard Rock, which is a very complex subject. And there is, um, I think, of today, quite a bit of confusion about what the government and what the uh, Department of Planning want and what the Metropolitan Aboriginal Land Council want, what the council wants. So I'll start off um, with um, Toby uh, as the Liberal um, candidate to explain where is this at with the government at the moment? What is the position? on Lizard Rock and the, the housing application. Well, thank you very much. The position is very clear. Under a re-elected Liberal government, the proposed development at Lizard Rock will not proceed. And I was so pleased to be a part of that announcement recently because it's something that I've been advocating for since I was selected as the Liberal Party candidate on the 21st of January. But it is also something we can own as a community because everyone has been involved in their strong advocacy on this particular issue. Nobody wanted the development, not one person. I couldn't find one person in the community 
that was supportive of this development. Regardless of who the owner is, an inappropriate development is an inappropriate development. There are no services down there. There is bushfire risk. And most of all, it's a location of intense ecological value and Aboriginal significance. So I congratulate the community for working together on this because it was a fantastic outcome for our community. And again, can I emphasise, under a re-elected Liberal government, this development will not proceed. And I will make sure that happens if I am elected as the member for Wake Coast. Um, so, Michael Regan, um, I will ask you, because it is privately owned land as it happens, and I believe that in the past the, the landowners there had submitted to have that area incorporated into a large national park um, in the area with an Aboriginal um, essence to it all, which was refused in the past. I wonder what your position would be on that proposal. It's really simple. Um, and with respect, Toby, it should never have got as far as it got. And it shouldn't have been done on the 23rd of December and been approved, despite the fact that all MPs were against it. Your government still allowed it to happen. And it still, I'm sorry, is allowed to happen. And until such times as there is a government. So, what do we do? So that is true, Anna Maria. That uh, another proposal was Ralston Avenue because they own a significant portion of other lands around it, bushland around it. And back in 2011, 2012, that was also kicked to touch. But one of the things that we negotiated was the potential to lock it up as an Aboriginal national park and all lands down to through Narrabeen Lagoon catchment and the like to make sure that became all Aboriginal national park on the basis that they may be able to build on that Ralston Avenue. However, that also failed the bushfire tests and numerous other ecological tests, and the community was against that. So we've approached the government numerous times to buy the sites, use something creative. They can buy national parks, sorry, they can buy private land all around the state and create national parks. Why can't they do that here? It's not hard to do, and there's lots of different methods you could use to do that, but no one's pushing for it. So that's where we're at. It's still live, and until we see it, uh, legislation coming that kills it off. It's still alive, and we heard today that the Aboriginal Land Council are going to challenge it in court. Um, also, I have a number of submitted questions on this issue, including three that might be, I think, from uh, the Metropolitan Land Council uh, members. Um, would, I'm wondering, is Nathan Moran here? Would he like to say something, ask a question? Uh, I just the purpose is to hear from the candidates tonight. You're happy, okay. So, well, and there's no court action. There's no, sorry? No court action, that's been incorrectly reported in the papers there. There's no court action, and what you're saying is a lie. That's okay, I've said that's what we reported in the papers today, and I think Nathan said that on radio that we're going to take court action yesterday on 2GB. You're saying, you're saying as, a, as a mayor of the Northern Beaches, well over 10 years, you denied our development. Correct. And you continue to do so because you're, you know what? You're anti. I'm anti the development, yes. You're anti, and also, and you've got to be very careful here, Michael, you've been anti towards us, we have a need. We have a need. And we want to get our members out of poverty. Like the people who are living on the Northern Beaches. They're in, in very esteemed places at the moment. And because of our members, and it's not our fault that we've got a land claim, it is not our fault. It's the process of government who allowed us to buy the land. When it comes to, comes to Aboriginal sites, yes, there are Aboriginal sites, but it's not, and it's not 100% Aboriginal sites. It's only a portion of the land. Thank you, sir, and we'll, we'll move. And my name's Alan Bunner, I'm the chairperson. Whatever you said, Michael, and also other members, you've got it wrong. And you always continue to put that picture up and you always get it wrong. I'm wondering, um, Sue, as the, there could be a Labor government, what your view is on this? Okay, my views are that regardless of who owns the land or who develops it, the application should be merit-based. And that's all that we can go on. So if Labor win government, our planning minister, Paul Scully, has said that we will work with the MLALC and with the local council to find the best considerations for everybody. Thank you.
Uh, and also, Ethan, and uh, would you like to talk on this? So I'll just preface my answer by uh, agreeing with Sue in that, you know, the Greens will always stand against inappropriate development, no matter who's proposing it, where it's going. If it's inappropriate, that's what it is, and it can't go ahead. And then I'll say that we need to return local planning powers to local councils. This development shouldn't have gotten this far. If it was a council, a local council deciding local development, it would have been rejected straight away. This has been sitting on the planning minister's desk for over a year now. I have been protesting Lizard Rock since March 2022. And we've, we've been a very strong community in saying hands off Lizard Rock and the surrounding sites. There is no plausible case for safe development to go ahead in a bushfire risk uh, area. And that's what the Greens position is. Obviously, it's a very complex issue and we have to properly compensate the indigenous landowners because it is their land and they deserve to be compensated for the ongoing effects of colonisation in this country. We need to adequately and effectively communicate with all the shareholders involved in this project and come to an agreement that works for all of us. And that's what the Greens are offering. We will take this project to the table and we'll figure out what we can do to get a positive outcome for as many people as possible. Thanks. And the Animal Justice Party would also support that, what everybody here has said, um, because we really do need to stop the destruction of any bushland, any forests, because if we're going to be continuing the destruction, we are going to be paying the price for how we live our lives and how our future generations are going to have to live their lives. So I would, um, I support not de developing anything in those six parcels of land that are actually in the, the Belrose and French's Forest area. And um, the juxtaposition of this, um, uh, of, turning, of turning down housing, of course, is that one of the burning issues on the Northern Beaches is a lack of housing. And affordable housing is right up there with people's concerns. Um, and I have, um, there's a question here from Suzanne Fail. If she's here, she might like to ask that question. Look, this is mainly addressed to Toby. Hi, Toby. My name's Suzanne. And you're no doubt aware, and everyone's aware, of the lack of affordable housing. It's really in crisis in the northern beaches. I mean, one local member who became Prime Minister said at a forum very similar to this, homelessness is a lifestyle choice. I'd like to know how you'd address this issue. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. And can I just, on the first question, it was a love-in. How nice to have a bit of bipartisanship from all of us on Lizard Rock. It was fantastic. <laughs> Who says politics can't be nice? But returning to your substantive question and just reflecting on my uh, personal situation at the moment, I'm fortunate enough to live in a home that's owned by my family and Thankfully, I have a nice family and the rent is relatively cheap. But I must say, uh, I know that at some stage I'll have to move out of that house. And that is daunting. It is daunting exactly for the reasons you've mentioned in your question, because there is an issue with affordable housing, particularly here on the Northern Beaches. You wouldn't relate affordable and Northern Beaches together at all, really. But I'd like to think, well, I know that this Liberal government is trying to tackle that issue seriously. Just recently, we announced some reforms in terms of rentals. In December, a regulation came in, came in that prevents rent bidding. That was driving up the costs of rent for young people. That was a huge problem. Also, other um, reforms to protect renters with... Uh, sorry, I'm losing my thought here. In terms of lease and uh, the grounds for evictions. So that, that's some of the stuff that's been done around renters. But I suppose the substantive reforms that have occurred in relation to affordable housing on the Northern Beaches in more recent times is certainly the Premier's proposal to replace stamp duty with the land tax on properties up to 1.5 million and also the stamp duty concessions that already apply for houses up to 800,000. Now I know you might think Northern Beaches, that, does that come into it? But the government is focused on this issue and has made inroads in that regard to try and address the issue of housing affordability. We also have the accelerated infrastructure fund here in New South Wales that I think it's, it's delivering 89 million over the next four years to fast track housing applications to get more affordable housing into various areas across the state. So 
It is a serious issue. It's, it's one that I'm personally very worried about as a young person. I know that a lot of other people my age are worried about it as well. But certainly the messaging when I've been out in the community, certainly on the, the stamp duty reform, the feedback has been very positive and I'm encouraged by that. Um, there's quite a number of questions on affordable housing, so I extend it to the other ca um, candidates and to Michael. But before you answer the question about affordable housing, Michael, I think people would like to know, as the uh, incumbent mayor of Northern Beaches Council, what are your intentions if you were elected? Yes, yeah, certainly. Uh, so we've worked for the last, I think, decade or so getting the planning controls sorted under the state government's requirements which say that you can determine with new developments, say a French's forest or a, brook, uh, a Brookvale, where you can put in uh, caps of around 15% affordable housing so the new developments, so there's a thousand dwellings coming, 150 of those thousand will be um, affordable and given to a third party provider. So that's happening. That's also happening uh, in other areas, I think Narrowbeam is our first one, so we've appointed a third party, sorry we're about to appoint a third party provider to be able to manage that. It's different to public housing, it's social housing, it's a link went worth or it's an involved housing, it's uh, one of those. So council's done that, but it needs to go further. You've got like 700 plus sites um, locally in the Wakehurst area, give or take, which are old houses, old stock on 750 square metre blocks of land and they've got one or two occupants in there. So what we've suggested to the government is there's a shortage of, uh, of townhouses, the missing middle as Rob Stokes wrote about, and so we could potentially divide, sorry, subdivide them into three or four lots of 200, 250, 150, and, and put townhouses there. Keep the public people there, give them new premises, put in um, social housing uh, as one of them, and have private. And that private could be sold to a young family, could be sold to a, a family, down, sorry, a couple downsizing, but it gives options. And it's near infrastructure, it's near schools, it's near buses, uh, it's near supermarkets, and so that can happen relatively straightforward and it's got the support of council to be able to, to do that. And there's other models, I, I know uh, Ethan will probably talk about the, the build to rent model and other types of models which are out there and uh, which we need to look at very, very closely because there's no one single solution and that's got to be really acknowledged. And it's not one particular cohort um, that's impacted, it's downsizers, it's, uh, it's couple, young couples starting out, it's in that middle age bracket, it's all encompassing. And then there's a crisis housing. Did you know that council had 3,000 3, granny flats built in people's backyards and they're renting out for 600, 600 a week plus? That's 50, 60 square metres. Why aren't they being given to social housing and giving tax benefits potentially to the owners of the house? There's lots of options is my point. Thank you. And just the question I asked about if you are elected, what are your intentions in terms of your position as mayor? Oh, sorry. I misunderstood that completely. Um, my, sorry, I made that very clear, um, Anna Marie. So I was going to step down. If I'm fortunate enough to be elected as the mayor in uh, a few weeks, I will step down at the uh, council meeting of April and, um, and say it's been an amazing journey and I've been very privileged and humble to be able to serve my community in that capacity since 2008. And I've been... Yeah, it'll be, it'll be very fortunate to be elected to the member and I'll stay on as council. I don't want any by-elections or anything, so any costly. So we'll stay on council and serve out my term as is legal, as lawful, um, but I can't stand again. But I hope I'm in that position to choose that I um, step down as mayor. Thank you. Sue Wright, Labor um, talks a lot about affordable housing. What's, uh, what's your view on the northern beaches in particular where prices are just so extraordinarily high? Well, the population growth needs to be better planned and better matched to existing infrastructure, especially public transport. So we'll introduce a target of 30% affordable social and universal housing on public land, in particular also around transport hubs. So instead of clearing more land, we could use existing land wisely. Duplexes, granny flats, tiny house living, these are all options that could be considered. Not everybody needs a five bedroom house. Um, we need clever architectural plans as well to solve this problem. Another problem with the housing availability, especially with social housing, is the Housing Commission sell-off by the um, Liberal National Government. <laughs> At the moment, there's 50,000 people on the housing list. 50,000 people in New South Wales. So, when the LNP sold off the 23,000 dwellings, 
they promised that they would rebuild. They haven't. They've built 2,300 public housing from all the sell-offs around Millers Point, the rocks, and all different areas around Sydney. So all these people, they need housing. So they have to go to the private rental market or they become homeless. So it, it doesn't, um, you know, it doesn't help anything by not rebuilding the public housing. So we would plan to build a lot more public and affordable housing. Um, Airbnbs are also a problem. Um, there's a lot of uh, units and houses that are just used for Airbnb when they could be used for rentals as well. Um, and so we're also going to um, introduce a cost-saving measure with uh, first-home buyers. Uh, we'll abolish stamp duty on homes and units up to 800000 and then we'll give discounted rates for homes and units up to a million dollars. And this should help. This will also help with the cost of living as well. There isn't an instant solution. This is a long-term thing because it's taken a long time to get to this stage. But I really do think that um, a major part that we should do first is really concentrate on our public housing. Thank you. to transport and congestion. Uh, there's a lot of questions about that. Uh, personally, um, I've been um, following the debate about the tunnel for so many decades. It's extraordinary. <laughs> and we still don't have one. But um, there is a question. Uh, I'll ask... I'll get one on... Is it yours about transport? OK, sure. Hi. Um, <coughs> the... Could you just give your name, please? David Stewart. It's... Um, the public transport policy seems to be captive to transurban and has been for decades. Um, Australia has something like 18, 17 to 18 per cent of its carbon footprint is from public transport as opposed to a world standard average of, of 11 per cent. Um, rail is at less than half the carbon footprint of cars. What do all of the candidates say about having underground rail coming here to the northern beaches? Uh, look, um, Ethan, could you kick off with that one? Uh, thank you very much for the question and just uh, immediately answer it. So if elected, I will call for a feasibility study into the expansion of the Chatswood Metro line to the northern beaches and whether that be under or over rail. Uh, overland rail, I believe that we truly need rapid accessible transport options on the northern beaches and with the tunnel project now being postponed basically, they say it's shelved but it's still sitting there in the ranks waiting to come out. It's $13 billion, a destructive mega project, it's got no transport lanes and it's basically going to have a massive toll slapped on it and it's going to be charging us just to get into the city quicker. So we need free accessible public transport which is the Greens policy for this election and we will make sure that every mode of transport in New South Wales is fully electrified as soon as possible so we cut down on those transport emissions. I am also, and the Honourable Justice Party are also um, all for public um, transport systems. Um, we need to get the cars off the roads uh, we need to improve the system that we have right now. We also need to have more cycleways um, because if we're going to be creating another um, tunnel, more and more cars will be going into the city. Where are they all going to go? And if we're going to be having EV vehicles, where are they all going to be able to charge up? So we really need an improved system. So I've, I've always been a little bit against um, having a trans the um, train coming to the beaches, but it may be something that we may need to have a look at if, it's, if it means that it's going to be protecting um, the bushlands that we already have here now and protecting the, the um, air quality from those people who would have been um, getting a lot of those um, pollution, the pollution from the chimney stacks that would come out from that you know, cross city tunnel. Um, and the other thing, just one other thing I would like to say is that the animals also we are building, we've built so much um, infrastructure and roads through their wildlife um, corridors, through their habitats. That's why we also need to factor them in when we are doing anything, to, you know, have, doing anything different to um, the, the public um, system as well. Thank you. Um, there's, um, 
there's a direct question on this about congestion of public transport directed to, uh, from Nicola Bootkin. Is she here? Could you ask your question, please? Thank you. Hi, I'm Nicola. So this is a question for Toby. Um, the Liberal Party has been talking big about the Northern Beaches Tunnel for years, and it's still in the concept stage. Meanwhile, you sold our buses and ferries. Congestion has only gotten worse, and our public transport is at breaking point, as seen on Thursday with me trying to get home from work. Why vote for you to fix this mess? Nicola, thank you very much for your question. First of all, the well, first of all on Beaches Link. The government remains committed to Beaches Link. There are reasons, economic reasons, why that project has been pushed further down what is called, I'll just wait for the phone to turn off, what is called the infrastructure pipeline, and that was supported by our independent infrastructure body at the time in making that decision, but it is very much on the radar still. In terms of selling off buses, I'm not aware of that. What we have on the northern beaches and more broadly around the state is a franchise system whereby the government retains ownership of the assets. The government owns the buses, it owns the depots, it sets the fares and it controls the routes. Now, that is not the information that necessarily gets out there in the public domain, but that is fact. And the same applies to the other modes of transport. And sorry, I now have forgotten the second part of your question, Nicola, but in relation to public transport, we've got a few challenges with our bus network at the moment, but you have to remember it was the Liberal government that introduced the B-Line, perhaps the most popular public transport initiative here on the Northern Beaches. I got the B-Line into the city the other day. I got the B-Line into the city the other day. It got me in there quickly, comfortably, and it's just a fantastic service. It's become an icon of the Northern Beaches, really, the big yellow buses. And prior to the last election, such was the popularity of B-Line, the government said we're going to introduce an east-west B-Line from DY to Chatswood. That has been delivered and that is also a popular mode of transport for many locals on the northern beaches. Unfortunately, you're never going to get everyone out of their cars. There are just some people who want to drive. And the feedback that I've had throughout the campaign, since I've been campaigning, is that locals want Beaches Link to occur and if elected, I will push for that to happen. Sorry, I'm answering the same question, am I? Right. Um, I, I, I sit somewhere in the middle of both of these in terms of the, um, the, the tunnel. I, I support the Beaches Link Tunnel with conditions. Uh, I disagree that it only goes to the city because it goes to Chatswood, North Sydney, St Leonard's, and it connects us up and it actually gives a great deal of access and it doesn't bring with it the development that uh, people think it's going to do because we've done the studies. My concern is, is the Beaches Link is never going to happen in our lifetime, again, getting so close. And there's been no plan B and there's no push for plan B to solve the congestion. We've, we've got a plan. We, as a council, we've gone to the um, federal government, put out a plan that says that we can do a massive piece of infrastructure for under a billion dollars, which breaks the back of the congestion locally through the beaches, from, from Balgala Oval to Mona Vale, Powder Works Road, Mona Vale Road, which is getting some widening now, which is great, but it has the most impact. In terms of looking for a train, uh, I've seen the different studies, and at the moment, this government and I believe the ALP, and I'm happy to be corrected on this one, um, it comes with a cost of development. And we're talking a green square or a Rouse Hill for every train station or metro station. Now, if you've been out there, Meriton's building in DY is about half the size of the buildings you'll see as a result of a metro station because it's something's got to pay for it. You're not going to just get it for the sake of... Um, you're not going to just get this development or that, that tunnel just for fixing up the current problems or issues. That's not going to happen. So I'm a realist in that regard. I'll push what we can get. I support getting a study, if only so that um, we can rule it out or rule it in. If the community may well say, you know what, we're happy to take all that high-rise and become like Bondi, become like Sutherland. No, but that, I don't want that. I know a lot of people don't want that. So I'm happy to support it, if only for the fact that we see um, some facts get out there and people can make their own actual informed decision on it. In terms of the public transport, uh, what's happened, we lost bus routes. Um, the B-Line was never designed because it was done by the four councils, Mossman, Manly, Warringah and Pittwater, for the state government. And they, to their credit, pushed that plan forward. They asked for it, we did it, we delivered it for them, they delivered B-1. 
they didn't do B2 at the same time, and we've got a scaled down version of the X160. And it's taken routes away from, and direct routes to the city, other routes to, um, to major areas. And that's what people want to see back, their old routes, plus have the option of B1. They want to see the Kia ride, not just go from Warrie Wood and Mona Vale. They want to see it go from all different bus stops. I know James Griffin's just announced it's going to happen in Manly, but we've not heard anything about here in Collaroy or DUI or down at Manly Vale or Brookvale. So I think you guys need to start talking about how we're going to make that happen so we can serve all of our community, including the forest. Naturally, um, naturally, health is also one of the um, big issues here today. Um, Sarah Camille, are you here? Is it, you've got a question about that? Um, yes, it, it's about the Northern Beaches Hospital, which I believe was built with taxpayers' funds. It has recently come to light that uh, the Northern Beaches Hospital is leased to an offshore company in the Cayman Islands for the, the grand sum of $1 a year, and I'd like to know if you think that's a satisfactory deal for the people of the Northern Beaches, and if not, um, what, what can be done to get a better outcome for us? Uh, that question is directed at Toby, is that right? Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much for your question. The Cayman Islands, I don't know anything about that. The most important thing for residents... <laughs> I don't know about that. The most important service we can provide, the most important factor here is the service that is provided to the public and private patients who go to Northern Beaches Hospital. And can I say, from the experience I've had from my own friends and family who visit that hospital, the service is absolutely brilliant. We have health staff there who provide a compassionate and professional service like you just wouldn't believe in what is a world-class facility. Public, private, same level of service, fantastic new facility. Honestly, no, I don't know anything about the Cayman Islands and I don't propose to get into that. We were fortunate, we were fortunate, if you go back X number of years, we had two old hospitals riddled with asbestos and what happened is the health community, the clinicians, the doctors, the nurses came together and said, we want a world-class facility. French's Forest was selected and we now have the end result that we have in Northern Beaches Hospital. And what is even better is that the sites of those former hospitals have been repurposed. You go down to Mona Vale Hospital, the former Mona Vale Hospital, it's a health hub. It's got a rehabilitation service down there. Just recently I remember going down to the, new, the opening of the new uh, palliative care unit and palliative care is such an important service that needs further enhancing on the northern beaches. And the geriatric evaluation unit for seniors. If I could continue without being interrupted, please. Thank you. And then up at the other end of the at the other end of the beaches, up at the old uh, Manly Hospital site, we now have Australia's first adolescent and young adult hospice. An absolutely incredible facility. <laughs> Australia's first here on the Northern Beaches, providing a service at the most challenging of times for families. So in all of that, and of course it would be remiss of me not to mention the new $50 million Brookvale Community Health Centre, I know where I'd rather be living, on the northern beaches, because public health has been enhanced like it had never been enhanced before over these last 12 years of Liberal government. Uh, so to say that the, um, the health system on the northern beaches hasn't been privatised is just out and out a lie. So we lost two public hospitals, Manly and Mona Vale, and we got a private public hospital. It's fine if you've got private health insurance, there's lots of services available to you. If you're a public patient, there's not as many, and the wait time is huge. So we had a, a gentleman who was telling us a story about he needs dialysis. So he couldn't get public patient dialysis, he had to go to the SAN to actually get dialysis. He lives at the Northern Beaches. With losing the two hospitals, we lost the East Wing at Manly, which was a great facility for mental health. We lost 14 beds at least there, and we've got way less at Northern Beaches. Shame. Excuse me? What did you say? Was that a question or just a comment? Okay. 
So we haven't got a good public what, health what system. What I'd like to ask then is if, if Labor was elected to government, would you fund a new public hospital on the northern beaches? Uh, we're looking at the, the Mona Vale Hospital site, but then it's also to hold the owners to their contracts, to their KPIs. The current owners are not the first private company to own the hospital since it was opened, and they do... Um, you know, lodge their, their money in the Cayman Islands. So I just don't think that the, the, the private public model works. It hasn't worked for the Northern Beaches. We need so many more services. We've lost our public clinics. So the women's health services, the gynecological services that used to be at Mona Vale and Manly, we don't have those. They're now private clinicians. We don't have access to these public clinics anymore. And when you can't afford private health insurance, which I'm sure a lot of people can't, you need these public services. You need them for your children, all sorts of different reasons. This Northern Beaches Hospital isn't a model that's worked for us. Thank you. Oh, I think I'll just, I, I think we'll just move on uh, because we can't have every candidate answering every question. One of the issues of this election has been gambling and the clubs and the pokies, uh, which have uh, wrought havoc in our communities. Now, Toby, you are or were a director? So have you resigned from the DY um, RSL as a director? But I wonder what your personal view is on this issue of curbing in uses of the poker machine. Thank you very much. Just to be clear, uh, to be total up front, I was a director of DYRSL. I've resigned that position. I was vice chairman of Harbord Bowling Club. I've resigned that position. And I was also involved in Clubs New South Wales. I've resigned those positions. That occurred fairly immediately after I was selected as a Liberal candidate in January. But having served in those positions, I do come to this particular topic with a degree of knowledge and experience. And I know from having been involved in those organisations that clubs are amazing places in our communities. They are focal points for individuals, for families. They provide funding to local groups, legislated and additional funding. And generally, you know, providing what is a subsidised service in terms of food and concerts and, and other services for people that people love. And that's what I've seen, or that's been my experience in the years that I've been involved in those organisations. But we do have problems. And those problems have been identified by the Crime Commission and they relate to problem gambling and they also relate to money laundering. And when the Premier finally released his proposal, I have to say, on balance with that experience, that I thought it was an excellent proposal. What he has proposed will make it almost impossible. It won't eradicate, I don't think. I think that would be, that'd be dreaming, but it'll make it very difficult for criminals to, to launder money through poker machines. Big issue, tick. It also provides greater mechanisms for individuals and their families where an individual has a gambling problem to address those problems. Now, a lot of people can go in and play a pokey, put in their $20, and that's it. In the same way that someone can go out to a pub, have one glass of wine, and that's it. But there are some people in our community, like with drink and with gambling, that do have a problem, and they are the people that we need to support, and I think those proposals that have come through from the Premier will do that, and I'm wholeheartedly supportive of those proposals. Uh, we have a question down here. My question is for Toby on that theme. Oh, my name's Susie Morgan. Um, in 2020, Rudy Hill RSL did not review, renew their membership to Clubs New South Wales. At the time, the CEO, David Arrington, said Clubs New South Wales were bully and an out-of-control gaming lobby group. Given the death and misery caused by problem gaming at DYRSL, why did you continue to remain a director of Clubs New South Wales? I've, I've already answered. I've resigned from DYRSL. I've resigned from Harbord Bowling Club. I've resigned as a state councillor of Clubs New South Wales and I've resigned as the regional president of the Clubs New South Wales Northern Metropolitan Region, which is more or less an umbrella group for clubs to come together and discuss club-related issues. So I'm not sure where the information's coming from that I haven't, 
but I've certainly tendered those resignations and I've got that in writing and I'd be happy to show it to you after the meeting if you want to see it. As it didn't take me so long, it happened almost immediately after I was pre-selected. So, moving on... I was pre-selected in January and I resigned immediately after. Excuse me, I think he has answered the question. There, there wasn't a need for and me to resign. And he's also offered to show you the documentation after if you wish to see it. Um, Sue, right, um, Mr Minns was rather slow to join this party. What's the current position? Uh, the current position is we've got some good reforms around the gambling, but I still don't think that they're strong enough. So I'll be advocating within the party for stronger reforms on gambling. I also don't think that they have gone far enough. Um, the government really, it, it looks like it's a preying, preying on people who are not able to stop their gambling habits. Um, they're people who just um, are addicted and we need to get those, those forms of um, gambling out of clubs. Uh, Queensland never had them for quite some time. Of course, they, they introduced them and then they've got gambling problems as well. I've known personally people who've lost their entire houses um, and then they don't want to do, lose their entire houses, but it's because of the, the process that's there that they are able to do that. And the other thing too with, the, um, with um, making cashless machines, what happens is there's those people, if they are addicted to gambling and they want to win money, they will go to horse racing or greyhound racing. So the whole system needs to be looked at. Um, and I know it's bringing lots of money into, you know, for the government to be able to use in other areas, but we really need to look at what's happening to the, the individual people. Michael. Oh. Yeah, okay. Ethan and then Michael. So I'll just say that the residents of Sydney are the biggest losers in the world when it comes to gambling losses on poker machines. That means we lose more money than the people of Las Vegas do on gambling machines in Sydney. The Greens want to get rid of pokies in pubs and clubs within the next 10 years. That's 2033. All machines gone. WA has banned pokey machines in pubs and clubs and they've been able to make up that lost revenue through uh, alternative income like live music. The Greens will fully support these pubs and clubs in transitioning away from pokey machines which cause such incredible damage to vulnerable communities who are then left behind. We will implement a 60% super tax on pokey machine profits which will ensure that once those machines are gone that will be funded in perpetuity for the next decades to come to fund those gambling harm and reduction programs. So the Greens want to recalibrate the gambling system. We want to end all gambling advertising on TV, on your phone, everywhere. We are having... <laughs> there are kids... Regan, you're going to top that? <laughs> no, that was going to be my line. I'm going to ban it. Um, I, I, yeah, if I was going to say that it doesn't go far enough, the five years or the Labor Party policy. Um, and quite frankly, if you talk to the CEOs, the ones that will, that will eventually blow the whistle on all this, um, it's not going to take five years to do as per the, the, government's, the current government's plan. It can be done within one or two years quite effectively, quite easily to put those cashless cards in. We're not asking the right questions. I learned very early on in politics to ask different questions and um, don't take no for an answer. And it's funny, when you start to probe a bit, you actually find some cracks and then you start to go down some rabbit holes and it's interesting what you discover. So um, there'll be some, a lot more to come out sooner rather than later about those, uh, those poker machines and the CEOs know they can transition much quicker than five years. So, and it's good that uh, everyone wants to help the clubs transition, that's great. Glad we can all support that. But the banning of ads and sporting ads, as, as, uh, I've got a 19-year-old son, an 18-year-old son, and they're just, that didn't happen when I was growing up. Watching football, watching cricket, it's all there. And stadiums are named after it. Um, and we even had Four Pines Brookvale Oval, an asset that council owns, because we lost control of the naming rights of that. And then we had to put, put a stop to it when we had the opportunity. That's disgraceful. So we need to make sure and we need to go further. Thank you. So uh, as the 
former National Arts Report of the ABC, I have been heartbroken by the demise of arts and culture in our communities, uh, the whole country, the lack of opportunities for artists to make a living, to make a career. And it's been quite interesting to see Brookvale emerging as an arts and cultural uh, precinct, quite organically, really. And I have heard from a number of people there who want to set up businesses and they want to know that there is going to be some protection in that area for live entertainment because side by side I understand there's also development for future housing in that periphery. So Michael Regan, what undertaking could you give to the arts and cultural society, uh, community that if elected the SEP could be changed to protect the arts and community culture there so that as soon as the pub music goes to midnight, a whole lot of people around like, uh, object and want the music turned off. Uh, yeah, perfect. Um, so council's been working very closely with that group of um, collective businesses down there called BAD, Brookvale Arts District, and they're branding them accordingly. Uh, we've looked to approach, well, we have actively approached Department of Planning and the, I think it's called the Office of 24 Hour Commissioner, Michael Rodriguez, the, the nighttime economy. Um, who's very supporting is looking to put grants out there to make that happen and to activate it. Council has said that we will support that 100% and will protect them, but we need the planning department who are an interesting beast and not doing what they need to do to support. So these two bureaucracies aren't talking and we need, because it's on the border, you need both the Manly MP and the Wakehurst MP working together to get those bureaucracies together to make it happen. Council has committed to doing it. Council has committed to upgrading the infrastructure for upgrade of street lighting, footpaths and, and the like to make it happen. But in terms of the development you talk about, you can't build residential on that side, on the eastern side, except on Pittwater Road where it's already permissible, which is like what they call shop top housing on Pittwater Road. And the current structural plan um, with additional housing is on the Warringah Mall side. So it's away from the, um, where we're allowed. So we're asking if there's additional permitted uses so that you can have music to midnight, one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning, 24 hours essentially. So that's happening um, actively and we just need a couple of state MPs to really nut it out with the bureaucrats. Thank you. Um, some more questions from the audience. I think uh, that's someone up Hi, there. Hi, I'm Bailey and my question is for... Name, Tope. please. Bailey, oh, and my question is for Toby and Susan. What is your stance on the greyhound racing industry? That's a gambling industry and, and quite cruel as well and controversial. Thank you. Thank you very much for your question. I don't have an issue with that industry. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah. Greyhound industry is a horrific industry. If you just scratch the surface and find out what they do to greyhounds, the number of um, dogs that are killed every year, the number of dogs because they're not that fast enough, just today another greyhound was killed on a track. They are dying every single day. Another, it's another horrible industry that also is, is um, preying on people who have an addiction to gambling. The people that... Um, that are, that are making money on these are also part of the whole problem, that they think that they can make money on having, you know, having greyhounds, breeding them into existence and um, using them for whatever use that they want. They leave them in the box if they're not fast enough. They use live baiting. They are, it's a horrific industry that really there are, huge in, there are huge issues with it and it needs to be banned and it needs to be stopped urgently. <laughs> Sean O'Shaughnessy, and um, it, it's a tragedy to come to, uh, to, to, to this area and find that the Northern Beaches koalas have been wiped out and that Sydney's koalas uh, in Campbelltown and across the rest of the Sydney Basin are being wiped out. And I can tell you now from the northern uh, rivers of New South Wales where I've been going into the forests, our forests are being smashed by this Liberal government. And uh, I'd like to know if, uh, of all the candidates, whether if you're elected, if you will stand up and end public native forest logging as a matter of urgency, or if you're going to stand by and let our koalas become extinct in this state. Okay, uh, we'll, we'll, get, let, we'll let everybody have a go on this, but please just keep your answers very short and we'll just run down from Toby right down the line. Okay. How short is short? 
The New South Wales koala strategy we have here in New South Wales presently is the largest single investment into the preservation of a single species ever made by a government in Australia, and I think that's fantastic. Absolutely, if I'm a elected as the member for Wakehurst, hopefully in a coalition government, I will do absolutely everything I can to protect koalas. I don't know how many people in this room have encountered a koala in the wild. There really is nothing like it. It's just wonderful. It's such a loved public animal in Australia. What about the logging? What about the logging? That on, was... on the logging, what we have at the moment is a transition away from old, established old growth forest logging to plantations. I'd like to see that transition happen a lot quicker than how it is now. So we can move to a... I'm sorry, my patience only goes so far. I have, not inter I have not interrupted anyone all night, yet you continually heckle from the front row. Would you please just allow me to answer the questions in silence? I'll answer it. He is. Everyone else up here is being respectful, and we'd ask the same from you, please. So that transition that I've just referenced from the old growth forest, logging in old growth forests, to plantations and other sustainable measures. I'm really supportive of that. I'd like to see it happen quicker, and I'll advocate for that as the member for Wakehurst. Martin. Thanks, David. I, my, my short answer to that question, sir, was I was asked recently about if we had a minority government and I had the position of balance of power. One of my first topics I raised was that exact issue, and I would support that 100%, so yes. Ethan. Uh, I'd just like to start it by saying that the Liberals, since they've been in government, have tripled the rate of land clearing in this state, and yet they've set a target to increase the koala population. Well, you can't have both, and I'd like to know how quickly you'd like to actually phase out of native forest logging. The Greens will immediately put an end to native forest logging in this state, and we will fully fund a transition plan for the workers impacted by this change. In addition to that, we will create a new generation of environmental laws that will establish rights for nature to better protect environmental species, populations, communities and biodiversity. Sorry. <laughs> Most definitely, the Animal Justice Party would support stopping of all logging. Um, we need to have the Great Koala National Park as well. Um, we need to protect all bushland for the koalas, the swift parrot, the, the, the little um, eastern gliders, and all those animals that are dependent upon a good, healthy biodiversity and of the bushlands and forests that they have. We cannot continue the destruction, and I really believe we need to stop and have a moratorium on all the destruction of all um, native forests and bushlands. Um, and I just, there's one other thing that it's a hard thing for people to hear, but we also need to factor into that not only logging, but how we are living, what we are choosing to eat and what we're choosing to wear. Because the biggest, one of the biggest um, reasons that there's um, logging happening is because of animal agriculture. And if you have a look at what's happening with that too, there's ocean dead zones, there's um, species extinction. Uh, you just have to scratch the surface. It's a hard thing for us to hear because we need to change our own behaviour as an individual. But we're going to have to meet that very shortly. Stop the logging and we have to look at what we are doing as individuals. Thank you. So right. So I'm too opposed to logging native forests. Uh, the Minns Labor government will help save koalas from extinction by protecting key habitats and restoring environmental protections. We'll commit to creating the Great Koala National Park and by ensuring the koala corridors are transferred from the ownership from Sydney Water to National Parks and Wildlife Services. Thank you. Thank you. And another question up here, and then you'll be next. Thank you very much. My name is Mark Pryke. Question to uh, the Mayor. Uh, privatisation, you've got me worried. You are saying to people that you're against privatisation, yet in 2018 in the Council, and I've been to a few of your meetings, you leased out for 30 years the Warringah Golf Course, the uh, local uh, hunter bowling club, and also the tennis club. Now, Michael, are you sitting on the fence, or have you privatised the fence? <laughs> oh. 
Um, we went through a very, so that's the Warringah Golf Club you're talking about and the development mm-hmm. of the North Manly Bowling Club. And so the community done a consultation on that and we'd gone out to say that we should package that all up as one that the golf course manages the uh, the recreation facilities there for the community. So we went through a very transparent process which ended up with um, the golf club, our Warringah Golf Club, was tender, I think finished second on the tender. Number one was a private business who was going to run that whole thing and it was still a public golf course and it was still public assets that council maintained. So that was all still happening, that was part of the deal. I'm not aware of the tennis thing. The tennis one is, that's been going on for decades in terms of Tennis New South Wales and Tennis Australia work with councils to basically look out, um, look after the clubs and run it models that suit them to grow the game and grow that for the community. So they're not privatised, they're not for profits, so, and they run those clubs. So we've got a number of different, club, different tennis centres all across the Northern Beaches, all run by some are basically like ones... It's, it's very different not-for-profits running it, which is um, in the mind with what Tennis Australia and New South Wales Tennis want. Was there another one you mentioned? Because I know the golf clubs all run separately, and so we set the fees. The bowling club. Oh, the North Manly Bowling Club. Great example. That tend has been won by Manly Warringah Gymnastics, um, which is the number one gymnastics um, club in the country, producing the best gymnasts in the country for Olympians. They've just got a grant for $5.1 million from the state government to um, build a great community facility there. They're going to borrow another few million dollars on top of that. And yes, we've leased that to 30 years of that not-for-profit to build the next generation of Olympians and um, families. It's great. Uh, question in the front row. Oh, hi, um, Kath Piper. Um, just asking a question of Michael. Um, basically about the cost of living on the northern beaches. You talk about addressing the cost of living on our beautiful northern beaches. However, for the last 14 years as mayor, you have voted for council rates to rise every year to a total of twice the rate of inflation. That has added the cost of living pressures to northern beaches residents. Are you being cynical? Do you care about the people of Northern Beaches? That's a great question because the residents of the Northern Beaches want their services to be maintained and increased. They want their... They want their... And so what we've seen is we've seen a trajectory of land values more than double on the Northern Beaches. Then we've separately had services increase. We've had decrease in rates and an increase in rates. Overall, your rates have gone up about 22% in that 14 years and the land values have gone up over and your land values have gone up well over double that. So we have all voted for the increase and it's all been in line with IPART. So IPART sets the... Thank you. It's my own Miranda Causey right here. So we've got... Um, we've got an. So what we've got is a system where the IPART sets the independent rates and we're in line with... And they set it as a part from councils and we've stuck with that and we've increased our service, we've delivered budgets and we've delivered increased services and maintenance. So therefore, it's... No, you actually made a you actually made a savings on the bins. No, it's not the bins. You made a saving of two hundred dollars a year. No, you yes, you did. Uh, it's not a debate, actually. You've asked so, the question. Yeah. So if you're Thank running you. on the rates, why not waste? We can talk about that as well. Yeah. All right, last question. Run for councilling debater. Okay, um, over there. Ah, uh, last question, really. <laughs> I thought we were going on to eight forty, Nigel. Anyway. We'll sort that out, please, your your question. Hi, thanks very much to all the candidates. Um, So, my name's Sarah Baker, and I'd like to ask a question about um, climate. Uh, Big big kind of missing topic. We don't have a teal independent candidate, but it's very, very important for us. So, my question, uh, Matt Keane, who is the New South Wales Energy and Environment Minister in, in 2019, said that there's absolutely no need for coal beyond 2030. That was actually in line with um, the UN Secretary General um, in order for us to keep to no more than 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels of of warming. So very, very critical, and yet we've seen the New South Wales government approve the Narrabri Narrabri coal extension, underground coal extension, through to 2044. So my question to all of the candidates is, will you unequivocally commit to ending coal by 2030. Uh, we'll, we'll, reverse, 
We'll reverse the order, starting with Sue from Labor, this end. So Labor have got a um, uh, policy to uh, have zero emissions by 2050. Um, and personally, I'd like to see no more fracking, no more mining. So when you belong to a party, as everyone would know, there are always internal discussions. So I'm also a member of LEAN, which is the Labor Environment Action Network, and we work within the party to strengthen our environmental policy. So that's what I would be doing. Um, thank you. Yes, for the Animal Justice Party, no new coal, um, no um, coal seam gas, no PEP 11. We need to be using renewables, and it would be a really great thing if we were able to get those renewables and market them overseas ourselves. So we fully support the Greens and I, we fully support net zero by 2030 and no new coal and gas whatsoever in New South Wales. We want to make sure that we create a state-owned energy provider that will lead the drive to renewables, cut down energy prices not just for homeowners but for renters and tenants, and ensure that everyone has access to reliable and affordable electricity in this state. Thank you. And Sarah, you would have noticed today that Alex Greenwich and the independent candidates, including myself, announced today that that's the policy we're taking to legislate that. No new coal or gas over and above what we already need. And we know that most of it's getting exported, right, out of the country. And, and so we don't need any more coal mines. We don't need any more gas. We've got to protect that food bowl. And so we've made an announcement and a commitment to legislate that with the EDO and others to make sure that it's done right and done properly so that we don't have to be talking about this and we can transition away. What I want for Wakehurst is to actually do revive McKellar County Council. And I want to see how we can do that with microgrids and solar and using roofs and selling to our neighbours and have it as a co-op. There are so many opportunities and the legislation actually exists and we can do that and lead it locally uh, and help rapidly trans um, transition away from what we know we need to do to reach those targets. Thank you, Sarah, for the question. You mentioned Matt Keane in your question and I'd like to acknowledge the important work he is doing. He has ensured that New South Wales is at the forefront when it comes to climate action. Our position on this is well publicised. It's net zero by 2050, 70% by 2035, sorry, 50% by 2030 and 70% by 2035. And the advice I've received is that we are on track to meet those targets. My personal view in relation to coal-fired uh, power stations, I tend to agree with Michael. I don't want to see any more coal-fired power, coal -fired power stations on on top of what we, all, what we need and what we have at the present moment. We are in a transition phase away from that and towards renewable energy. I'd like to see that happen quicker. We need the former because at, with cost of living the way it is at the moment, we also need to ensure in that trans transition that people have access to power generally and power that is affordable. But I'm pleased that New South Wales is leading the way in terms of the transition to renewables. I support it and I'd like to see it happen a little quicker than perhaps how it's proceeding right now. Another question from the floor. Um, hello everybody, it's Jeff Conroy. Um, I'd like to direct a question to Michael. Um, we know education is the most important thing for the future of our society. I'd like to know, Michael, in the current situation with education, the future is looking really, really, really unclear because of teacher shortages. What do you see as solutions to solving teacher shortages? And if you are elected, which of the major parties' policies, Liberal, Green or Labor, do you think you'd be likely to support? A good question, I better read all of them then. So, my, the simple question is we have to ask the teachers. We know what the problems are in terms of there's way too much, um, they do way too much, even 10 years ago and 20 years ago. So, 
I'm lucky enough to have a number of volunteers who are teachers and they're talking about the problems that they've got. The school principals are talking about the additional workloads they've had and it's over and above what they need to be doing, which is focusing on the students. The Gonski report, there's been some key recommendations from the Gonski report that haven't been implemented, they'd like to see implemented and that's something that I'd want to be making sure is a priority because we need to get the teachers because we, Rob Stokes, myself, Zali, Dr Soph, we all sat there, and James Griffin, we all sat and talked to Year 12 students, not one of them wanted to be a school teacher, not one. But they loved their school teachers, but they just felt sorry for them. We can't have that. So there's burnout. So we need to find out what the solutions are. And I don't think there is any one policy that has that solution. We know that the Gonski report, there's some missing actions out of that. We know they're doing too much. The principals are doing too much. And no one's attracted to the... So we've got a suite of problems. We need the answers to come from the teachers and from within. It's like the bureaucracy is out of control and we need to stop that. So I look to support someone who can do that and do it effectively and quickly because we don't have time. Uh, I suppose it's, um, it's, a, it's a moment to ask you, Michael, if the uh, major parties had a equal numbers of seats, which party would you support? Uh, as, I've said publicly, as I've said publicly, if I'm very fortunate to be in that position, then I'll be discussing that with those parties to see who has the best um, solutions, who's going to firstly present fair and reasonable government, fair and stable government. That is the critical thing for the whole state, because it's not just all about Wakehurst. We represent the whole of the state. Wakehurst will be looking at what's the best deal for us and what's going to make the best uh, outcomes for us. And I've spoken about things like the, the logging and the koala thing. That was one of the things I put on there, doing things differently with the climate and solar and things. So we need to talk about that and get a commitment from them within the first 12 months. It can't be, oh yeah, it's going to happen. It can't be an empty promise. There are lots of things to do. So I, I've got a great crew around me. There's a great community around me and I'm not going to make that commitment until such times as I'm in a position to. And I've spoken to my community and my volunteers. Thank you. And there's a question at the back there. Thank you. My name's Rob Brennan. Uh, I just wanted to ask, this is a question towards Toby and the Liberal Party recent publicity in relation to bushfire grants and what's happened in terms of essentially favouring the Liberal electorates. We've also seen the issue of Jennifer West having a crack at the state government in relation to misuse of power and misfeasance. Jennifer West was the candidate who was successful for the Trade Commissioner position. She was pushed out and John Barillaro got the position. So my question to Toby is, what are you going to do to stop this culture of jobs for the boys and looking after the Liberal Party when it comes to grants. Thank you, Rob, for your question. There's no sugarcoating it. I was as disappointed as members of the community were to read about those activities, particularly disappointed. I can't do anything about it unless I'm elected the member for Wakehurst. And that's what I'm hoping to be, <laughs> to be on the 25th of March. And I'd like to think that if I am fortunate enough to be in that position, I will be able to contribute to discussions and the implementation of policies, new policies, that prevent that type of behaviour from happening in the future. Because the public deserves better. Uh, we have a question up there. And then we've got, um, Kath, someone down here. Two people down here. Hi, my name's Lani. Um, I'm a registered nurse. I'm no longer practising. I'm here on behalf of my colleagues. I'm, behalf, I'm here on behalf of the heroes that saved lives here during COVID. They are overworked. They're in unsafe conditions. Not just unsafe for themselves, but for their patients, which means our whole community. I would like to know from each of the candidates if they support safe nursing ratios. Uh, that was directed to all of you. Yeah. I don't think we have time to do everybody. So, yes, Matt. Yes, 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 yes. Oh, okay, quick yes or no. I support the current ratio system, which has received bipartisan support from the Liberal Party, Labor Party, and the Nurses and Midwives Union. Uh, yes, I support what you're requesting. That's absolutely. Yes to nurse and patient ratios. Also the same, yes to better ratios. 
The same. It's a Labour Party policy in my own personal views. Yes, we need safe ratios. Uh, and a question from the front row. Yeah. And then the gentleman behind you. My name is Wendy Finianos, and my question is for the, um, all the candidates. As you can see, I'm a mum of a six years old, and I've been hearing, <laughs> and I've is. been hearing that there is a plan to roll out unisex toilets in public schools, and I'm very much interested to see what is the view of all the candidates about this issue because it's very important to know. So the question is, do you or do you not support unisex toilets in primary schools? I don't really see a problem with it. I, no, I don't see a problem with it at all. As long as the toilets are properly funded and they all have doors that shut, which they don't at the moment. So, yeah, I don't, I don't have a problem with it. Uh, sorry, um, can we clarify, was that a different question? No, no, what I'm trying, because unisex toilets, the, the thing is that replacing what currently the schools have, they do have, you know, female toilet and the boys toilet as they go right now, and replace all of that by just unisex toilets. This is what I would like to see what the candidate oh, yes, think so about. That was the question, yes. And, and we've had the first, keep passing the microphone, the first answer is, Sue supports unisex toilets, yeah. I also support unisex toilets, but I think there needs to be male, female, unisex, so that the children can then choose themselves where they want to go. I fully support them and believe it should be rolled out statewide, not just in primary schools. I guess I'm different. I'm going to say that it's... Um, you should have the choice of male and female toilets and, um, and unisex can be part of that mix. Uh, and it should be absolutely up to the parents of the local school and it should be up to the principal, but more important, the parents. It's their children. Uh, it's public schools. They shouldn't just be mandated or unisex. They should be simply given the option, let the parents decide what's best for their children. Michael and Susan have answered that best and I support their comments. Male, female, unisex, let's give people the choice to make their own decisions. Um, another question? Uh, Joe Earl, um, my question is to um, Toby. Um, there are some plastics uh, never truly biodegrade, um, instead break down to smaller, smaller pieces, um, become uh, microplastics, um, which can possess, uh, persist in the environment indefinitely. Um, what steps do you plan to take to ban the use um, of single-use plastics in New South Wales, um, given that um, Australia uses approximately 130 kilograms of plastics per year and only 9% of that is recycled? Um, and, you know, perhaps we could start with um, banning call flirts and political advertising. <laughs> Joe, I'll give, I'll give this thank you for your question and for the work you do, because I know you do a lot in the space of the environment and you've met with Brad in the past. I'll keep the answer short to give the others the opportunity, but in New South Wales, we've already done it. I know, I think, is there one more question? I think we've reached the end now. Uh, one more from the front row. There we go. And that's the last question. Thank you for that. <laughs> Michael, I have a question. Uh, while I've been out, <laughs> while, while I've been out handing out Toby's pamphlets, a lady came up to me and she was in distress and she was saying that she's had a one-to-one -one meeting with you plus other councillors and it was about the Collaroy seawall. And um, she's still sort of concerned because their, their house is one of the few that's on a, ho a house between the high rises there. And I'm just wondering what is now going to happen at Collaroy for the seawall. And I wonder too if you might have a look down at Eden 
and see the uh, wharf that they built there with um, the, the stone and, and the waste and perhaps might be able to do something at Collaroy. Um, <laughs> that's fine. So the Collaroy Seawall, there's a number of people. So where to start? You've got the, one of the main arterial roads in and under there, that arterial road is a whole bunch of international communications cables that you know, access us to the rest of the world. You've got gas, sewer, water, electricity. You've got about a 30 minute distance between the sand and the road. Uh, we saw what happened in that big storm in 2016, I think it was, where it took away, nearly took away all those homes. The state government at the time um, was determined to put um, protections in place. Now, council had a policy um, with, I think, most coastal councils about sand nourishment and trying to do sort of, if you can imagine what they've done at the Gold, uh, Gold Coast in particular, is a type of area where they put more sand on the beach so it's far less likely to be impacted. The alternative solution was what they call sea walls, which are vertical, so it, um, and, but it goes under the sand. So the other solution is what's already allowed under existing laws, which was a, a sea wall, what you, as what you see now on Collaroy there, which is hard within the private boundary. Now, I'll give Brad Hazard credit for this. He and I both fought that um, with the bureaucrats. And we sat in a meeting once where we said, well, how far do you want the wall onto the, onto the sand, a sloping wall onto the sand? And they said, well, you tell us. And they just wouldn't approve it. And the minister, the Crown came in at the time and wouldn't approve it. So we were stuck. So the residents went, well, bugger that. We're just going to have to build one on private land. And you can't say no, council. And they were right. They used the existing laws because we can't say no. So we're stuck with this now. And what Ethan has said and uh, myself and others have said is we need an independent body to get oversight of that and take control. Because, yes, the houses and the infrastructure need protection. Full stop. But the beach does as well. And so if the solutions are there and the alternatives are there, why aren't we actually doing it? Why are we allowing the bureaucrats di to dictate this space? Because you've got the problem up the central coast as well, and that's a big deal to the central coast. You mentioned, I think it was Ballina or Bega. We saw it happen at Newport. Eden, Eden sorry, Eden. Um, Garden of Eden. Uh, and, then we, and then we saw what happened at... Um, there's other areas too, like Avalon, uh, was, Newport was impacted most recently. It's happening. So we need to be prepared for it. We need to do much better for that protection. The answer that we've got at the moment is not the solution, is not the permanent solution. Now, contrary to rumours, we have one more question. <laughs> Down the back. Yeah, thank you. My name's Alan Murray. I'm the chairperson of the Metropolitan Local Land Council. There's two questions to my uh, response is, what are you going to do about treaty? I'd like to have some responses from individuals. How far are you going to go and what extent in terms of New South Wales government? Also, there's going to be a royal visit in 2024 about the uh, 200 years of celebration of New South Wales government in Australia. And I want to put it out there to say to you this. My land council is very busy. We go overseas to bring, bring back skeletal remains of, of, of our old people. And we continually do that. And we bury our skeletal remains, the old people, in the northern beaches. This is where they were stolen by those anthropologists 200 years ago, 150 years ago. And we're doing that as part of our business. Please don't think that because we're black and we have a right to do what we think is right for our lands, particularly on the northern beaches. So any person in this room wishes to come and talk to us, gladly to speak to myself and the CEO, Nathan Moran, at Skippy Park, which is down the road here. We own that. We own that because we believe that we have a right to be here in the northern beaches. And I want to say to all, the, all these people on, on the stage here, what are you going to do about treaty and what are the compromises? Uh, so there's many questions within the question, but um, think... take it away, we're on treaty. I'll go first, okay. Um, the treaty's a great one. Uh, we talk to the local Aboriginal community here and they're very keen to talk about treaty. They're keen for council or state or somebody just to lead that um, truth-telling. 
treaty and you've got some great leaders, local leaders in the Aboriginal community here like a Susan Moylan Coombs, a Carolyn Glass Patterson, um, Tony McAvoy, there's a, there's a whole range of people locally, Aboriginal people locally, who all believe passionately, as do I, and I think probably our whole council, um, and I don't know, speak on their behalf, is that we want to have that treaty conversation and that truth telling. I'll happily lead that discussion, I'll happily be part of any of those, um, those things. So if you want to lead it, let's do it. Nathan, we're not ignorant. We just disagree. You do not hear select who represents us. We are an Aboriginal democracy, just like your lower level council is, and the state you aspire to. Do not disrespect Aboriginal land rights. We're legislated for this area. We are the representative body of all Aboriginal people. We're the body for all culture and heritage. Stop bypassing us, Michael, and select in your own community. Nobody's Stop bypassing you, Nathan. We do have a format here and we did have one question here which uh, we need to continue with the answering, which is about treaty. Tr about treaty. So the Greens fully support truth and treaty in New South Wales and that will be one of our top priorities in this next government. I think collaboration must be the, the number one priority um, and we need to also um, have an advisory committee with Aboriginal First Nations people who will be able to um, have their say about what needs to happen in this country. Thanks, Susan. I also support truth and treaty, and for myself, I'm a Republican. I wish we didn't have ties to the royalty with England. Um, yeah. Uh, Toby. Thank you, Chairman, for your question. And I have to be honest, the t points that you've raised, I, ha I do not have a vast amount of experience or knowledge. So the best thing I can say to you is give you an undertaking that if I am elected the member for Wakehurst, I'd love to sit down and chat with you as soon as possible so you can educate me further on these important topics. Thank you, and I, I'm sorry we have to, we, we don't have any more time for questions, but I think that that was an invitation to perhaps everybody here who might like to gather more information from the Indigenous owners and perhaps through the network, through Nigel Howard, maybe there could be some event for interested people to go and speak and hear uh, the story. I think that would be something many people would welcome. So, So we are out of time. Thank you to everybody for coming and thank you in particular to the candidates who have put themselves out here on hot toast for you to grill. And uh, we wish them all the best in the election ahead. And um, I, I think that um, we've all, we all understand tonight how lucky we are to be able to have public forums, that we have a democracy, that we can air our, our, um, our, our similarities and our differences. So everyone's invited to stay around a bit. There seems to be an awful lot of sandwiches over there and refreshments. So please stay around and have a chat to each other. And I'll now hand over to Nigel Howard from the Northern Beaches Climate Action Network for some closing remarks. Thanks everybody and uh, thank you all for coming. Um, I just thought I'd say, say a quick word about what Northern Beaches Climate Action Network. I'm going to first tell you what we're not. We're not an incorporated organisation. We have no board, we have no money. That's why we have a begging jar and I want you to fill it up. Um, we're just a network of organisations. Now, how many organisations do you think there are on the Northern Beaches that are concerned about climate action? More than 10? Put your hand up. More than 20? More than 30, more than 40, more than 50? There are actually 50 at the moment. That absolutely astonishes me, but that's how many groups that we can draw on from our network. That means we can draw on a huge reservoir of talent, even though we've got no money, and, res and we loan all the equipment from different people to make things happen. Now, what about, are we a partisan organisation? Well, we care about climate, and so 
um, you tend to think we might be partisan, but we're not. We're actually polypartisan. And we want every strand of political opinion represented in everything that we try to do. That's why you have all the candidates here this evening. We do have some royalty, and the royalty are our youth. Our youth are royalty because they can speak with unique authority, they can speak truth to power. So wherever we can use youth to represent our issues, uh, we, we try to encourage them. Um, our events are all ad hoc. They're all a bit flaky, as you can see. We stick stuff together with uh, grey tape and it kind of works. And um, in, uh, especially for um, Anna Maria, because I know that she loves to have a lectern. When we got here, there was no lectern. So we manufactured a lectern from her, for her now. And um, I know I'm going to get in trouble from ACF and my friend over there be for using plastic. But... Um, Climate action is such an important message, it is worth spending a little bit of plastic on promoting. So as you go out of the door, if you don't pick up a Climate Action Now um, uh, placard on the way out, I'm going to hunt you down. I'm going to hunt you down. So um, please pick up a, a leaflet, and if you want, we've also got a lovely uh, bin sticker um, that you can also take um, so that uh, we can promote this idea of climate action. Our main events are our, are our soap boxes, and at our soap boxes, anybody who turns up can speak, but nobody can speak from, for more than two minutes. Even if the Honourable Brad Hazard turned up, he'd only be allowed two minutes to speak. And <laughs> and uh, Joy is our bell ringer and bouncer, so I better move on. So I move on now to thank everybody. And the first person I want to thank is Catherine. Catherine Reach, come here, you. Come here, you. Without Catherine, these events would not have happened. And it's been an absolute joy to work with her uh, for all three of them. And we can get some sleep from now on, right? Um, and um, I want to thank... Uh, Michael Regan and the Northern Beaches Council for giving us the cheapest rate for this room. But, but next time we want the room for free because this is, this is a community service that we're putting on, all the volunteer effort. Yeah. Okay, well, we need a new mayor, it seems. So I want to thank all the candidates, firstly, for, for nominating. I think it's incredibly brave to put yourself in the firing lane by nominating, but even braver again to turn up to an event like this and face completely unscripted questions from the audience. So big hand for our candidates. <laughs> big thanks to our crew um, from all different places. So Wayne from Humph Hall, we've got big bunch of people from Voices of Warringah. We've got people of McKellar um, on the camera there. We've got Australian Parents for Climate Action running our, our uh, AV. Um, we had someone from Solar Alliance, Brookvale, at the last meeting, but not here now. And Joy, who belongs to every group, every one of the 50 groups. And, um, and my mate Alan up the back. Um, he's, he's, he's staying at the back because he's a, he's, he's a retired liberal and he's worried to get beaten up from both sides. And I want to thank Andrew from Northern Beaches Radio who's really helped support us. Um, with helping us with equipment, but also to let you know, this will be replayed at two o'clock on Saturday on Radio Northern Beaches. Listen on 90.3 FM or streaming on rnb.org.au. Thank you to all the media that are crowding to cover our event. And lastly, and definitely not leastly, I want to thank our brilliant moder moderator, Anna Maria. And we have a gift. 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 Oh, she's got it already. <laughs> I'm always the last to know. <laughs> what? Oh, uh, yeah. I, I, 
I need to m- mention Billy as well because um, she's just got back from South Africa. She, she's still jet lagged and she volunteered to lay on all the food and drink at the last minute and the big enjoy. So, <laughs> Captain Billy. All right, that's it. So now, uh, for all of you still with burning questions to ask the candidates that you didn't get to ask, now's your time to nobble them before they get out the door, especially after they've had a glass of wine. Get them to say something that they shouldn't, don't want to really say. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>